All right. Take your Bibles this morning. Open to the book of Matthew, chapter 22. Book of Matthew, chapter 22. We've been uh, discussing some related topics the past few weeks. You might recall to me what we've been talking about. Last week we talked about the book of opinions. Where in the Bible is the book of opinions? It's not. We looked at it. My opinions are not in the Bible. God's are. His opinion is the only one that matters. Right. So people often teach out of the book of opinions, and it doesn't exist. It's a figment of our imagination. What did we talk about before that? Who remembers? Aha, two weeks ago. War of the mind. The war of the mind. The war for your mind, more specifically. So we, you were saying, Brother Glenn, that many people have been taught the wrong thing. Why has anybody ever taught the wrong thing? Well, it's a war for our mind. So in Matthew chapter 22, in verse 1, turn there. Before we get started, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for the people here. We thank you for the chance to come and read the word of God. Lord, we ask you to open our hearts and minds to what you have for us today. Lord, help me as the speaker get out of your way. Help people to see Jesus Christ in his word today and not me. Lord, help me to say what needs to be said and not say what should not be said. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. In Matthew chapter 22, in verse 1, this is a parable. This is the parable of the marriage feast. Okay? So in verse 1, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready, come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants, and entreated them spitefully, and slew them. And when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and sent forth his armies, and destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So the servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. Let's pause there for a moment. This wedding is like unto what? In the beginning of the chapter, the kingdom of heaven. So this is how people behave when invited to the kingdom of heaven. They made light of it and refused to come. I remember a few years ago now, when I got married to my wife, we sent out a bunch of invites. We invited the people we cared about, people we were closest to, the people we loved and wanted to see there. Did every last one of those people show up? Nah, that's a wedding for you. About 90%. We did pretty good. But at my reception, my wedding feast, there were 20 seats not filled out of the 120 people I invited. It's not bad, but still, those people, you know, years later go, yeah, I missed your wedding. Yeah, you did. It's okay, I understand. I've missed lots of other people's weddings. We're busy here. But I didn't miss my wedding. Why? Because it was a priority. My mama didn't miss my wedding. She didn't find something more, better to do that day. Why? Because it was important, right? She didn't make light of it. I didn't make light of it. It was an important day. Folks, People make light of the invitation to come to heaven. Who was invited eventually? Everybody. The, the people that were invited first were the Jews. He said, though they didn't want to come, we'll invite everybody. Both bad and good. So only good people are invited to heaven. Is that what it says? No. Both bad and good. Verse 11. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. What does the wedding garment represent? 
the righteousness of Jesus Christ. A lot of people think they can just go to heaven because they're invited, but they don't have to have the wedding garment. They don't have to have the righteousness of Christ. Brother Glenn, how do we receive the righteousness of Christ? By faith. By faith. What happens to this guy? Verse 13. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Brother Mark, what does that represent? Hell. Hell. For many are called, but few are chosen. All right? So we know from studying the word of God that there is a final destination for every human being born. I am not a person that owns a soul. I am a soul that owns a body. My immortal soul will live forever. And when I was born, it had one or two destinations. I would either go to hell for forever when I die, or I could trust Christ and go to heaven for forever when I die. Those are the only two options. There's no purgatory. There's no third option. There's just no, there's no I'm going to lay down in the grave and go to sleep. I've been told that one. Hey, it's, when I die, it's all over. <laughs> Folks, you can be pretty ignorant of all the things of all the religions in the world. You can be pretty ignorant of the Word of God and still come to the conclusion that this life is not all there is. I had a man ask me one time, he goes, hey, you're, you, you spent all your time in church. I was a much younger man at the time. I was 21. You spent all your time in church. You believe in God. You think you're going to go to heaven? I said, yes, sir, I do. And I said, no, I don't think I know. He said, well, when I die, I'm going to go to sleep, and I'll never wake up, and it's just over. So what happens if you're wrong? At the time, we were working 80-hour weeks. My smart Alec response was, I'll get a good night's sleep if it's just all over, and, I get, and that's rest. Now, let me ask you, sir, what happens if you're wrong? Now, he had just had a baby. He had a, he had a little six-month-old son at the time. I said, are you willing to risk your son's soul on you being the smarter person in the room? Right? You're, you're smarter than me. You know that. So you're, you're sure I'm wrong. Are you willing to bet your son's soul on whether or not that's all there is when, when this life is over? He didn't have an answer. Like this man here, Matthew chapter 22, he was speechless. And a couple of the people listening go, he's kind of got you there, buddy. He's made a point. Folks, if I'm wrong, what are the consequences? If you're wrong, what are the consequences? If, if there isn't a, a heaven and a hell, but we know there's a heaven and a hell, the word of God tells us there is. And everybody, if you ask, just about everybody, you go take a microphone down the street and you go, hey, you think you're going to go to heaven when you die? Most people will say, well, yeah, or I hope so. Or I'm trying, or I think so. Well, that attitude indicates that they really think they're going to. They'll pull out some seventh or ninth inning win, some twenty-third hour. Uh, you know, I'll be good when I'm older. When I'm when I'm in my sixties, I can't get into too much trouble, so I'll I'll be good, and then God will let me go to heaven. This is people's attitude. They think they'll go to heaven. They don't have any good reasons why most of the time, but they think so. Why? Because they don't like the alternative. If people really and truly saw that their eternal destination was hell, they would make some different decisions. Would they not? And I'm not talking about, oh, this person's out here living in sin. Yeah, that'll get your attention. But what God is concerned with is what you do with Jesus Christ. God doesn't care how much you've messed up. He really doesn't. He doesn't care where you've been at all. He cares where you're going. He wants you to trust his son to go to heaven. And he's not that terribly concerned with sin. Why? The penalty for sin was paid. Amen. Turn to Matthew 23. Turn the page. Turn to Matthew chapter 23, verse 13. Who's going to heaven, folks? 
The religious crowd? Ooh. Verse 13, Matthew 23. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. Who's that? Religion. The religious crowd. Hypocrites. For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye that are entering to go in. What a crime to be le levied against you by the Son of God. What a crime that is. Ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. How are they doing that? Let's keep reading. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. How does that happen? Brother Glenn was talking about it earlier. Feed him false information. If I have a child that comes to me and says, Pastor Josh, I want to I want to trust Christ, I want to go to heaven. Okay, get down on your knees, and you pray this five-point prayer. We're going to dunk you in some water, and you're good. That child will believe that. And will carry that with them the rest of their days. Unless somebody pulls them off that path. Amen. Made them twofold more a child of hell. Why? Because they're comfortable. I've got what I need. I don't need anything else. I did what I was supposed to do. I'm, I'm fine. Folks, if you've got any salvation other than the blood of Jesus Christ. And the work on Calvary. You don't got anything. All right. Verse 16. Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. Whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. We talked a couple weeks ago about blind, blinded minds. These men say, Oh, I know what the truth is. But their minds are blind. We know that the God of this world blinds the minds of them which believe not. Bless the glorious. I can't remember the verse now. Bless the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ shall shine with them. Thank you. All right. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. How common is this problem? Oh, Brother Josh, this is a, a thing that just happens to a few people. Oh, this is, this is, this is for the, the Muslims or the Buddhists, the ones that don't call, claim the name of Christ. Is that the case? Is this just for the other religions? Turn to Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. It says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow <clears throat> is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly there are ravening wolves. What's a wolf want? Do they take care of sheep? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Only in the they clean their plate kind of way, Brother Mark. Right. They take care of them. Right. Wolves are not a sheep's friend. What does God call us? Sheep. sheep. All right. The false prophet will devour you. Think about that for a moment. Will devour you. They will kill you and leave no trace. Well, that, doesn't, that doesn't sound accurate, Brother Josh. You, they, maybe they preach and they, you know, they, they go on. They don't say, no. If you believe a false message, you've been devoured. Skip up to verse 22. Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. It says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. That sounds pretty good. Sounds, sounds like a lot of people. The answer is heartbreaking, folks. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Not that I knew you at one point, and you fell away. Not that I kind of know you. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. 
How heartbreaking. <clears throat> All right, let's see. So we know, we know that your options are heaven or hell. We know that most people are on the wrong road. How do we find the right road? Turn to Matthew chapter 5. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. And back up a couple pages here. He told the Pharisees, they showed up the kingdom of heaven. Right? Verse 17, Matthew chapter 5. This is what Christ came for. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. See, the Pharisees accused him, you're just here to make trouble. You're just here to cause problems and chaos. No? I'm, here. I'm the answer to all your problems. Verse 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever, therefore, shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. We already established that the Pharisees were the most religious people in the land at the time. So how does your righteousness exceed there? He said, you need something they don't have. You need something they don't have. Jesus goes on to explain what it is that they don't have and what you need. You need him. That's what he tells in his ministry, in his words. That you must have Jesus to go to heaven. If you were to turn to John chapter 3, I'm going to read a couple verses. But if you were to turn to John chapter 3 and verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. I still have pages turning. I'm going to back up. What is it that Jesus expects from us? And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What's everlasting life? Eternity. Eternity. Does it mean we're not going to rot away and, and, and our bodies will never die and we'll be on earth forever? No. Thank God, no. Doesn't take long. You know, get past 25, brother, and Things don't work as well as they used to. My knees hurt. <clears throat> Where did that come from? Just getting old. You know, you get up in the morning. You know, oh, y'all, y'all saw me one day. Just embarrassing day at church. Y'all remember this day? I couldn't hardly stand up. I'd thrown my back out. Why? Just getting older. Folks, eternal life doesn't mean we'll be here forever. Eternal life is talking about the kingdom of heaven. So how do you get into the kingdom of heaven? How do you gain entry? How do you skip hell? How do you switch roads? I just read it. Somebody answer me. Believe. Believe. Yeah. Believe what? Believe that you prayed the right prayer? Believe that you're so special God won't send you to hell? Believe what? I heard this joy. Somebody say it louder, please. Jesus Christ. Believe that he paid the penalty. Amen. Turn to Luke chapter 23. Turn to Luke chapter 23. This is a story. Now we know that Jesus Christ never lied, so it must have been a true story. Y'all agree with that? Right. Okay. So this story actually happened to somebody. 
Jesus, knowing all things, tells it to us. Quite frankly, it's a very sad story. Try to find it if possible. Ah, uh, that is not the right printer. Sorry, Luke 16. Yep. I wrote the wrong one down. I did warn y'all at the beginning I made a mistake. All right. Uh, Luke chapter 16. Verse 19. This is the story of the rich man and Lazarus. I should hope you've all heard it before. We're going to look at it again. Luke chapter 16, verse 19. And there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. Let's pause there for a second. He died and was buried. And in my Bible, the punctuation is a semicolon, which indicates a continuation of a thought. So there wasn't anything that happened between verse 22 and 23. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes. Folks, no purgatory. There's no second chance. There's no reincarnation. There's no pass go, collect $200. It is straight to hell when you die. But this man... All right, let's continue in verse 23. And seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus, Lazarus in his bosom. Well, how did Lazarus get there? Why does he not go to hell? And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember thou, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. And likewise, Lazarus, evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. <clears throat> what did he want? What did he want them to go tell? Hey, there's a hell. Avoid it. Hey, that's enough information to start with. That's all you need to know to get started. Hey, I don't want to go there. <clears throat> all right. And Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Right. Well, Jesus is telling us the story of two different men and two different destinations. Did the rich man go to hell because he was rich? No. The Bible does say it's difficult. It's not impossible. It is easier to go for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Did he say rich men can't come in? No. no? Abraham was a rich man. The Bible says he was, like a prince. It just says it's difficult. Why would it why would that be the case? A lot of money to do all this. Well, he didn't need God. He had everything he needed. He fared sumptuously every day. Why would Lazarus need God? Life was rough. Life was rough for Lazarus. <clears throat> it doesn't mean that the rich man couldn't have gone to heaven or that Lazarus in his rough life deserved heaven. But Lazarus, we know, must have trusted Christ. For those are the only people that go to heaven. And we know that the rich man must not have. That's the only reason people go to hell. In John chapter 5, verse 39, don't turn there, but it says, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, 
But they are they which testify of me, and ye will not come to me that ye might have life. That's what the rich man asked to go tell my family. And Abraham answered, they have Moses and the prophets. They have the scriptures. Amen. What's in the scriptures? Jesus says, they testify of him. That's, that's your answer there, rich man. They are that testify of him. Turn to 1 John chapter 5, please. 1 John chapter 5. Look, salvation is not a, I think so, I hope so. It's not a statistically probable. It is what we call in computer programming a binary option. Either you do or you don't. Right? There's no in between. You cannot sit on the sidelines and pretend that you don't have to that it doesn't apply to you. Every single person ever born, this applies to. My little daughter that's two months old. I had to think about before we had children, knowing that I would bring us help bring a soul into the world, knowing that if she chooses to reject Christ, her soul will go to hell. I'll fight my whole life if I have to. Amen. To at least make sure she knows the truth of the gospel. There's still that option. She still will have to trust Christ. Or she'll go the same way this rich man did. <clears throat> Folks, don't ignore your invitation. Who's invited to heaven? Oh, Everybody. First yes. John right. chapter 5. Good and bad. I find that Amusing. Good. Hey, good and bad, bring them on. Jesus accepts all. First John chapter 5, verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God, and everyone that loveth him, that begat loveth him also, that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood, and it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you, that ye believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe in the name of the Son of God. Folks, everyone's got two options, heaven or hell, and you have an open invitation to heaven. Jesus calls to you, says, don't go to hell. I didn't make that for you. It's not where I intended you to go. But you have the choice to believe on Jesus or not. Folks, trust Christ. Trust Christ to take you to heaven. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for this church and the people here. Lord, we thank you for this time. Lord, we ask you to bless these people. Help us as we witness to our loved ones. Help us as we minister to the world around us. 
Bring us back safely next week. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.